Next on Unsolved Mysteries. A convicted felon is behind bars for a crime he swears that he did not commit. Is the guilty man his identical twin? In California, authorities search for the arsonist who set this house on fire and then videotaped the blaze. A suspected drug dealer ambushes two detectives. Today, he's still on the run. A 20-year-old falls in love with the girl next door. And now he's searching for their child, who can inherit over a million dollars. Five stories. They're all strange, but they are all true. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Greensboro, North Carolina. It's midnight at a local motel. Heavily armed robbers take cash and jewelry from the five people in the room. It's all over in a matter of minutes. Police arrest 22-year-old Frederick Young based on eyewitness testimony from one of the victims. He is convicted of the robbery and sentenced to 68 years in prison. We've all heard the story before. A convicted felon says that he's innocent a case of mistaken identity. But in the case of Frederick Young, there is a crucial difference. He says that the real criminal is actually Cedric Young, his identical twin brother. We were very close, closer than anybody. You know. We dressed alike all the time, did mostly everything together. It was a bond there, you know what I'm saying? Much greater than any bond, you know, like, friends or anything, you know, or any other relative in the family. It's just close. Cedric, or Ced as he's called, was born four minutes before Fred. From the start, it was almost impossible to tell the twins apart. Cousins, aunts and uncles, sisters and brothers, nobody knows Ced from Fred. If you don't see him when they do something, you don't know who did what. If I can't do it, I know you can't do it because I'm the one that had him. The night after the robbery, luck was not on Fred's side. Everything that could go wrong did. How you doing, officer? What's the problem? Did you know your license plate light is out? No, I did not. I'm sorry. Is this your driver's license? Sure, no problem. Fred admits that he had a history of trouble with the law. Otherwise, he might have acted differently. You know what, officer? I think I left it home. I don't live that far away. What's your name? Cedric Young. Spell it. C-E-D-R-I-C. -E I gave him my brother's name because I didn't even have any driver's license. You know, my brother did. Keep an eye on him. At the time, it seemed like a good idea to use Cedric's name instead of his own. Cedric, turn around and put your hands behind your back. What's the problem, officer? Your license is revoked. License revoked? Cedric Young? Yes, you're under arrest for driving under a suspended license. Oh, this is ridiculous. And at the same time, he asked me, could he search the car? I told him, sure he could. Things were about to go from bad to worse. He saw searching the passenger side, and he reached in and grabbed a bag. Officer, 
Officer, I swear to you, I never seen that gun before in my life. That same gun was later linked to the hotel robbery. At the police station, Fred came clean about pretending to be Cedric. But by then, it was too late. He was charged with armed robbery, and so was his accomplice, Chris Ross, who was a friend of the twins. Now, what happened after they came into the room? Buster and Tina was in the bathroom. During the trial, one of the victims claimed that she recognized Fred during the holdup. Do you see that person here in this courtroom? Fred says that until that moment, it had never occurred to him that his twin, Cedric, might have committed the robberies with Ross. When she pointed directly at me, that's when I kind of figured in my head, you know, if she think it was me, it's definitely my brother. He says he then asked his attorney to subpoena Ross. Right there in the courtroom, I said, subpoena Chris Ross, but it didn't happen that way. He didn't do anything. Not long after the trial, Fred's attorney would have his license to practice law suspended for a number of violations, including neglecting his client's cases. He never called Fred. He never wrote Fred a letter. As a matter of fact, he never even accepted a call coming in from Fred. Since the trial, Ross has freely admitted that he did put the shotgun in the car without Fred's knowledge. It was my shotgun, and I put it up under the car seat. I didn't come forward with my information for the trial because nobody tried to contact me to give my side of the story about him being charged with something he did not do. Ross plea bargained and received a 20-year sentence. Fred, however, refused to plea bargain, insisting that he was innocent. Fred was found guilty of six counts of armed robbery and given a separate sentence for each conviction. Total time in prison, 68 years. They picked up the wrong one. Fred wasn't with me, it was said that was with me. The reason why they picked up Fred, because he got caught with my gun. So they figured he was the one that used him. The way my client was sentenced, even if he were guilty of something, we think the sentence is out of whack. But it makes it even worse when he's not guilty to get that kind of sentence. I'm willing to take any polygraph test, anything, whatever it has to take to prove that I'm innocent, you know, I'm willing to, to go along with it. He never said, I'm innocent. It was my brother you want, not me. He waited until it went to trial. Trial didn't go as he hoped it would, I think. And this became a desperate effort on his part to throw the blame elsewhere. I had no idea, you know, that my twin brother committed these robberies until the lady pointed directly at me. That's when I come to the conclusion I knew it was my brother. At some point in time, did A year you after the verdict, Fred got another chance. The Court of Appeals agreed to consider new evidence. Chris Ross took the stand. Did the two of you, in fact, commit these six armed robberies? Yeah. These same but his testimony failed to persuade the judge. Fred was denied a new trial. Finally, the most important witness came forward, Fred's twin brother, Cedric. On a national talk show with millions watching, the question was put to Cedric. Are you the guilty party? No, I'm not. To be in his shoes, I would be saying the same thing, exact same thing. Uh, Why you won't lie, man? My brother, man. Damn. Don't do me like that, man. Quit let me, making me suffer for something you done, man. If I was a rich man, if I had money, I would spend all of my money to get my brother out of jail. I'll, I'll spend all my money. <laughs> I'll spend all my money to get a high paying lawyer to get my brother out of jail because I miss him. <laughs> Fred had served his time and was released. As far as the courts are concerned, this case is closed. 
But if the twins' mother was the judge, the verdict would be very different. I'm hoping that something will come out of this that I'm dealing with now, that Fred is released and he can go on with his life. And Sid is punished because he has done a great hurt to me and everybody. Was it Cedric or Frederick? If you have any information about this case, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, a deranged arsonist videotapes his fire and adds disturbing commentary. <laughs> You're about to go inside the mind of an arsonist who is so cold-blooded that he set a fire and then stayed around to videotape it. This case begins with the discovery of his jacket. Stockton, California. It was a scorching hot summer day. After overheating, a car pulled off the road. The owner was a man we'll call Joseph Villa. He and his son went looking for the nearest phone. On the way, they noticed a camouflage jacket on the ground. Inside a pocket, they found an unlabeled videotape. They decided to take the videotape home and to watch it. This is the actual video. The family turned it over to the police who are convinced that the person holding the camera also set the fire. It was assumed the disturbing voice on the tape belonged to the arsonist. Look at the fire. It's beautiful. Look at that. Can you see what I could do later? Can you see what I can do? I've never run across anything as eerie as this tape. Frightened me. As a matter of fact, uh, I thought about it that night when I went to bed. Investigators studied the tape in order to pinpoint the location of the fire. Look at it, Omar. Okay. Look at it. Omar. Look at it, Omar. Look at it, Omar. When we listened to the tape, it was hard to understand uh, certain words that this person was saying. So we sat down. And we actually went through this tape, I mean, hundreds of times, and came up with a script. Look at it, Omar. <laughs> this is what I've been doing on your week's vacation. <laughs> I said I'll do it. I said I'll do it. <laughs> he says, I told you I'd do it, Omar. Um, is Omar the property owner? It's a. Uh, it's a revenge type burn. Is Omar the construction person that maybe hired this person and fired him and made that a revenge motive for the fire? Don't really don't know. We don't we really don't know who Omar is. Okay, is this the jacket? Yes, that's it. Okay. Did you see anything else? A county arson investigator accompanied Joseph Villa's brother to the spot where the tape was found. Amazingly, the jacket was still there. In it, they found a wooden pestle the kind sometimes used to grind herbs for satanic rituals. Nearby, they also found a glove that matched the jacket and a ceramic skull. The skull, like the pestle, suggested Satanism, as did the words of the arsonist. Hell. I call hell. My hell, the whole sky is black with smoke. The fire that I will destroy and burn my soul up. Ancient spirit of evil. Those are basically the clues all we have on the video. And that's why we need to find out where this went down. Where is this home? Look at it. The fire department's trying to 
put it out. What a laugh. As we viewed the tape, we realized that there was fire suppression equipment uh, that had responded to the incident. And we thought if we can enhance the tape, bring those shots in a little bit closer to us, we may be able to get a door mark or a house number or maybe even a fire department insignia on the door. A frame-by-frame -frame analysis did not reveal any new details. Investigators were still unable to match the tape with any reported fires in the state of California. The tape was found here, just a few yards from Interstate 205 near Stockton. The 205 feeds into several major highways. Authorities believe that the fire could have happened anywhere in the U.S. and that the arsonist might have only been traveling through California. I think the person who made this videotape and is responsible for the fire will, without a doubt in my mind, continue to set fires. And the person needs to be apprehended and stopped before his fires become more destructive. And then there's a few of these type of serial arsonists that will move into another criminal area. Uh, you may recall the, uh, the son of Sam back east who uh, killed six people with a 44 Magnum. He was responsible for about 2,000 fires in the city of New York. And then he stopped setting fires and started killing people. Look at the flames. Listen to the coyotes yell. <laughs> Listen to them. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> The house appears to be a one-story ranch with two chimneys. There is another house on the left side of the picture, partly hidden by a white trailer. The trailer indicates that the burning house was possibly under construction. Because fire engines arrive at the scene, it seems certain that a report of this fire would be on file somewhere. Update. Within minutes of our broadcast, several viewers called and identified the house seen burning on the videotape. It was located in Redwood City, California, 80 miles west of Stockton. As we were sitting here and we looked at the film on the TV, we realized with utter shock that it was the house behind us that was on TV. And our family was scared, to say the least, because we didn't realize that the film even existed. And we called in the Unsolved Mysteries and gave all the information. Surprisingly, on the night of the blaze, Woodside Fire Captain John Dullinges also videotaped the fire. While I was setting up the command post, directing companies in to extinguish the fire, I had set up my video camera to film the fire for training and investigation purposes. By comparing Captain Dullinges' tape with the video shot by the arsonist, investigators were able to confirm that this was definitely the fire's location. Some of the calls received led us to a 17-year-old Woodside youth. We interviewed that youth. Through that interview, it led us to a 19-year-old Redwood City youth. He was arrested and interviewed and subsequently admitted burning the house, taking the video, and was the one who talked on the videotape. Both suspects were underage when they set the fire and were tried as minors. One served time at Juvenile Hall, the other was committed to a state mental hospital. <laughs> Next, a suspected drug dealer faces a long stretch in prison after he ambushes police. Oakland, California. All right, he's, he's got something, he's giving it to the guy. Okay, the deal's going down. It's Acting on a tip, detectives stake out a liquor store parking lot. All right, Ramirez is backing out. Okay, Ramirez is out. A suspected drug dealer, Roberto Ramirez, has set up a sale. Ramirez is no ordinary dealer. He distributes cocaine from Oakland to LA. The word is, that Ramirez will do absolutely anything 
for money. He would often deal out of his house. He'd often have his children, two small children, uh, grammar school age, uh, carry the cocaine in backpacks and uh, bring it to the buyers that way. After obtaining a search warrant, police converge on the Ramirez home. Oakland and Fairfield officers are in on the raid. No one knows what to expect from Ramirez. My assignment was to pry the iron grate on the front door. The safest entry that we make is a quick entry. It gives the people inside less time to prepare, and normally we catch them in, in that surprise mode. My position was to cross in front of the house, and then I would cover the window um, and the side of the house for anybody trying to flee or, or uh, any attack coming from outside the window, through the front window. 1.42 AM, showtime. Police officers, search warrant, open the door! Police officers, search warrant, open the door! Ramirez's silence is a challenge, loud and clear. Come and get me. Suddenly, he appears at a side window. Two officers fall. Detective Smith is severely injured and is dragged from the line of fire. Officer Burrell takes refuge under Ramirez's window. Hold your fire, I'm coming out! I took a physical check of myself. My legs worked, um, I was clear thinking. My left arm didn't work, uh, my shoulder was numb. Go, go, go. Get him out, get him out! But the other officer isn't so lucky. Detective Smith is bleeding profusely and must be quickly evacuated through a neighbor's house to a waiting ambulance. Ramirez still won't budge. Reinforcements arrive from eight other police departments, and now 30 heavily armed officers surround the house. OK, he's coming out. After a two-hour standoff, Ramirez finally comes out. However, he is hiding behind his wife, who is eight months pregnant, and their children, ages 10 and 6. When Ramirez came outside, there was a lot of tension. He had shot two of our police officers. And he had a lot of time to think about what he had done. Anything can happen. Uh, you don't know what's going through their mind at that point. Ramirez was arrested on two counts of attempted murder and a laundry list of drug and assault charges. Ramirez was released after posting bail of a million dollars. Six months later, just before his trial, he and his wife packed up their children and disappeared. They are still on the run. I was shot through the upper left arm. Um, it was basically in and out. Um, it severed the nerves in my left arm and left me with no feeling, although I have uh, a mus uh, um, strength and muscle uh, flexibility in the arm, but I just don't have any feeling in it. I remember muzzle flashes, and then my next memory, I felt like I had been hit with a baseball bat in the stomach. I can't pronounce most of the things that it damaged, but it was most of the internal organs in my abdomen. I'm always going to have the scars and the, and the pain and, and, uh, and all from it, but it would give me some satisfaction if he was caught and, and was in jail serving his time and pain for what he's done. Roberto Ramirez is 5 feet 6 inches tall, and weighs 210 pounds. He is considered to be armed and dangerous. Detectives have searched for him 
throughout California and Mexico. If you have any information, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, the Queen Mary, once a luxury ocean liner, it is now said to be haunted. Long Beach, California. This is the famous Queen Mary, now permanently docked. On her decks and in her corridors, people have seen ghostly figures and heard mysterious sounds that they just can't explain. I'd been here about 14 years when I'd first had the first experience with actually seeing what I thought to be a ghost. I was in the work area and there was a lady sitting there. She appeared to be in a late afternoon cocktail type dress from the 40s. No makeup on, she seemed to be very pale, but I never saw a movement. I left the table, turned around because I wanted to take another look, and there was nothing there. I am probably the last person that should have had these experiences because I'm such a skeptic. One day I was standing on the stairs of the pool and I saw a woman, probably in her 60s or 70s, in black and white. So I went down the stairs and around the pillar expecting to find her standing there. And she wasn't anywhere to be found. It was only a matter of seconds. She couldn't have gone anywhere. It is said that one way or another, all places are haunted and that they hold on to memories of past events. Perhaps that explains the ghostly apparitions and unexplained sounds that haunt the Queen Mary. The Queen Mary took her maiden voyage in 1936. During the five-day trip across the Atlantic, she was a floating party, a symbol of luxury travel in a gilded age. One of the first people to work on board was a marine engineer, John Smith. Part of my uh, duties was to check and learn this ship thoroughly, and so I explored it in the evenings on my regular day's work was done. Several times over a two-month period, John heard something unusual in the ship's bow where there should have been only silence. The sounds of metal tearing, water, rushing, and then men screaming. It sounded like there had been a rupture of the ship's hull. It was frightful. I went up to the extreme bow section of the ship. The sound was here, but there was no water. It had nothing to cause it. I don't believe in supernatural things, but in all my experiences as a marine engineer, I've never seen anything like this. Years later, John read about a tragedy dating from World War II. After being converted into a troop ship, the Queen Mary accidentally collided with a British cruiser called the Kurosawa. Over 300 men were killed. The Queen Mary's bow sliced the Kurosawa in half. After I read that article, I was so shook up and so overwhelmed. The very area I heard that mysterious water rushing was this exact same area that was damaged when the ship hit the Curacao. This is what it would have sounded and felt like if I had been in that compartment at the time. But I knew it couldn't be. That was 30 years earlier. It couldn't be anything. Dozens of other sightings have been reported. Late one night in the pool area, a maintenance supervisor, Kathy Love, and her co-worker heard mysterious sounds. After that, we came into the pool and I heard giggling. 
uh, sound of a little girl or a child playing in the area. And at that point, I noticed there was splashing. The splashing stopped, the giggling continued, and we observed the footprints of a small child walking across into the locker room. I know that I saw what I saw. I'm not sure exactly why I saw it, but I know it was there. Several other encounters have occurred in Shaft Alley, deep within the ship near the engine room. Here, during a routine fire drill, a man named John Petter was crushed to death by a watertight dog. Some believe Petter still haunts the area. I was working in the capacity of a lead guide, which meant my job was to close down the tour route and make sure that there weren't any stragglers behind. And I don't know why I turned around. Standing right behind me on the step was a man. He had blue overalls, and they were dirty. When I stepped aside to let him go by, he wasn't there. He was gone. I don't necessarily believe any other ghost stories that other people have come up with. I only know what I saw, and I only believe what I saw with my own eyes. There's nothing like actually seeing a ghost to turn a skeptic into a believer. And judging from the reoccurring stories, if you do want to become a believer, just jump aboard the Queen Mary. Next, a man searches for his child who he met only once and who is the heir to his estate worth over a million dollars. Pomona, California. For most parents, holding their baby for the first time fills them with joy. It's our baby, Mac. But for this young father, it was a moment of sheer panic that drove him away from the girl he loved and his newborn child. Max, don't go. Don't. The young man was W.B. Mac McDonald, now a wealthy businessman with a sizable estate, but no one to give it to. Mac McDonald knows that he made a terrible mistake when he ran away from his newborn baby. For decades, he has tried to find his child. McDonald's story begins when he was 20, and he fell in love with a girl next door. Her name was Mary Helen Carr, and she was just 16. The first time that I, I noticed my neighbor, she was in a swing on her front porch. There was a definite attraction both ways. The romance began slowly and discreetly. Mary Helen. Nice to meet you. I've seen you before. Uh, I'm just cleaning my bike. Uh, do you like to go for a ride sometime? <laughs> my mother would forbid me to ride that. Especially with you. Is your mother always here? Mary Helen's mother didn't trust Mac. But the two young lovers saw each other every chance they could, until Mary Helen's mother caught them together. Her mother blew her stack. You're lying to me It was now. very hostile. You're lying to me? Don't if she had been a man, I think it would have been a physical conflict on the spot. I felt that the world had just collapsed. It upset me, you know, because I was in love with a girl at that time, and we were planning on a future together. And here were these uh, tremendous stumbling blocks being thrown out into the path. 
Mac felt that he had no choice but to pack up his bags and leave. His destination, the oil fields of Texas. We both agreed that this was the best thing to do, but it didn't, didn't make it any easier. Three weeks later, Mac found himself in Houston. Soon afterwards, Mary Helen ran away from home to join him. Mary Helen called me from the uh, bus station there in Houston. And I tore the, tore the streets up getting down to the bus station. It was a very happy reunion. Posing as husband and wife, Mac and Mary Helen found a place to live. But their world would soon collapse again. Hello? Just a minute. You? Mac was tipped off by a friend that the police Hello? were on their way. I can't believe this is happening. What is okay. It? Right now. Mary Helen's mother was charging him with statutory rape and illegally living with a minor. It's okay, it's all right. Oh. That's fine. That's fine. I'll call you. Mac made his escape with only seconds to spare. I left Texas, and it was in the afternoon, and I didn't stop till I was out of the state of Texas. I was devastated. They jerked her back to California, and I had no way of contacting her again. A year had passed, and Mac returned to California for a new job. One evening, he and a friend stopped off at a drive-in in Long Beach. Mac? Mary? I almost fell out of the car. The waitress, the car hop that came to wait on us was Mary Helen. Los Angeles is a big city. It was a big city then. And the possibilities of driving into a restaurant and having her, the waitress, was like hitting a kino ticket here in Reno. Well, listen, I can't really talk to you, but I get off work at 9. Do you want to come by my apartment? Yeah. Here's my address. Great. You can see our baby. I have a baby? I almost had heart failure when it took my breath away. Because I had no idea she was pregnant. There was that possibility, though. So I told her I'll be right over. Her mother opened the door. Stay away from her! With this baby in her arms. I can press charges on you. Well, I thought, well, the police department is probably on premises. You know, this is just a matter of time till I'm going to be shackled and in jail it's over there. So I was so distraught when her mother opened the door that I overlooked the fact that she was about half civilized the first time she'd ever spoke to me civilly. I was in such a traumatic state of fear. The benefit of being able to hold, hold your baby for the first time, I, I missed that. Mac was terrified that Mary Helen's mother still had a warrant out for his arrest. In California, statutory rape was punishable by up to 30 years in prison. Mac stayed for less than five minutes. Don't go. He never even Don't. learned if the baby was a boy or a girl. I feel that I uh, made the greatest mistake of my life by not staying there and writing it out. 40 years, that's what it's cost me. I feel that the youngster's entitled to my estate. I'm not entitled to... Uh, be its father, probably. But I'd want that uh, youngster to know that even with the mistakes, that I love them and I want them to have the best. Update. On the night of our broadcast, Mac learned 
that he had a daughter. Her name was Sherry. The news came from Mary Helen Carr herself. One week after our broadcast, Mac arrived at Sherry's home in Denver, Colorado, for what would be a bittersweet reunion, especially for Sherry, who had been raised by a caring stepfather. No. Hi. <laughs> Come on Dr. in. Hi, <laughs> yes. Hi, Mac. Hi. It's hard to describe the feeling that I had for my daughter when I opened the door and she was there, and I was able to hold her. I don't want to hold you. <laughs> I just tried to come to the realization that it really was my father standing there. I don't know what to say. I, I'm still in a state of shock. This At this point in my life, to find that there is someone who is my father and who wants to establish a relationship with me, it's just emotionally very traumatic. Apparently, he wants to be part of her life. And if that's the case, it's OK. I hope since he's gone to this much effort to find her that he doesn't bring any sorrow to her. The fact that I didn't stay and fight the battle, it's most unfortunate. I don't believe I would do it that way again. However, yesterday unfortunately can't be redone. I'd like to. No matter how you look at it, he left my mother with a, with a tiny baby, you know, and I have to deal with that. Um, I have to deal with the fact that I have a father who loves for me, who's raised me, who's cared for me, but I believe there's enough room in this family for everyone, and I sincerely mean that.